Okay. Uh, pleasure. I'm sharing my screen now. Share. I hope you, you see that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so I'll go into the full presentation, I guess. Right. So that, that looks okay, yeah? Yes. Um, excellent. Uh, so uh, first, I'm really grateful for the chance to, to talk because um, I get the impression that um, talking about COVID uh, analysis using Microsoft software is not in huge demand. So the fact that I'm able to do it here is terrific. And thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I should explain, uh, looking at uh, my... Um... Uh, David, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can, we can see your... It's not in the full slideshow. We can see right. your next slide. Right, so I wanted to remove next slide. So I don't understand why it's not in full slideshow. I realise that. That's what I can see. Um, so let me, if I reduce it, uh, does it go? Um, yeah, this is really not satisfactory. I beg your pardon. I see that. Don't, don't uh, worry. Um, um, if you see the tab display settings at the top. Um, sure, tab display settings. Yeah, this is yeah. really helpful. Thank you. Um, you should presenter be to... view and slide view. Yeah, do, try and do, see if that will. Which, what do I do? Duplicate slideshow? No, no, swap presenter view. There you go. I think that's what you want, isn't it? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's that duplicate. Thanks for pointing that out. I didn't know whether you could um, you could see what I was seeing, but anyway, that's great. So um, I, I should explain that um, by by I've got disclaimers at the beginning. Look, the title of excelling it's a pun. It's absolutely not a boast. Yeah, it's just a pun. The fact that I'm going to be using Microsoft Excel and not R. I'm afraid. I apologize at the beginning. Also, I'm pretty much an outsider. That will become clear as I go on in the talk. You have to think of me really as more like a curious volunteer in RAMP who's been brought under the RAMP wing by, by Graham Ackland. I'm, I'm really grateful to Graham for that. Um, here's the, what I'm going to say in my, um, in my talk. I don't think I have to go into that. I'm more because it'll be clear when I, when I get to each of the, the bits of it. Firstly, how I got into this uh, game. So as, as you said, I had been in mathematical sciences and computer, et cetera. Um, what got me uh, back into the COVID game, well, you'll all remember uh, the charts which Valens and Wiki produced in late October um, with scenarios of 1,000 to 6,000 deaths per day by the end of December uh, 2020. And um, this was all before pre-alpha, you know. A few days after that, David Spiegelhalter uh, was interviewed on Spectator TV, um, and he gave a simple rule of thumb. He said, forget the charts, he said, the rough rule of thumb, which is good then, was one in 50 cases result in a death in three to four weeks. So I thought, I can try to understand that. And I sent, two or three days after that, I sent an email to David in which I'd done the simplest of charts. And this is just from the email that I sent. Remember, this is all how I got into it. Um, so the, on the chart, you see the dashed line is just the deaths data. It's seven day average. I think they're, they're deaths by reported date. This is really, et cetera, really trivial stuff. The blue uh, line is the cases, again, seven day average, um, and divided by 50, and, 50 and, and shifted by three weeks. And what you see is quite remarkable is that there was a really pretty good agreement between the two. And if you took this agreement as persisting for the next three weeks, then you would, it would imply that the deaths uh, would peak at around 450 rather than the, the 1,000 to 6,000. So I thought this was quite interesting, and I, I thought I'd better get into the, the game in a, in a, in a bit more uh, serious way than this uh, overly simple stuff. Um, it, there's a health warning. I mean, the more I know, the, the less confident I am about making predictions. That will probably resonate with most people listening. This thing, this chart is absurdly simplified. I'm going to talk about the importance of, of putting in other things like distribution of time to death, which is the weight and shift aspect of the W and S, which you'll hear about a lot from Graham, and the age dependence for the likelihood of death. That's, that's the scale or, the, or the, the case fatality rate. So in WSS model, Graham will talk about more, but it's, it's simply, it's drawing and building on, on these uh, ideas. That's how I got involved. So case fatality rates. Um, what, uh, I, what we're trying to do in, in this section is take the new cases by specimen date. Yeah, that's the chart on the left and map it on to the deaths in 28 days by date of death, yeah? So ideally, I want to be able to map the left-hand chart to the right-hand chart, take the ratio and see how close it is to one. And I'll show uh, charts of that later on. Um, the control parameter, this is, these are the parameters that I actually have in the model, right? In, in the workbook. Uh, we can allow for false positives for the B variant, which was before the 1.177, I think it is, then alpha, delta, there's a subvariant of delta, 
uh, and then the Omicron variants. I, I have not delved into the three Omicron variants that you've already heard about. And then there's the effect of the three vaccines. So these are the parameters that I play with in trying to get this map from new cases uh, to, to deaths. Hope that's, that's clear enough. So as I've said, cases are by a specimen date. Uh, deaths are within 28 days by date of death. And the 28 day specification is understood and, and, and vital. Uh, we've got to build in distribution of time to death. And this is the uh, only area where I'm using other than publicly available data. Initially, we did use publicly available data using log normal and gamma distributions, which have two parameters, and they were fitted uh, to, uh, to uh, optimize the map uh, from uh, cases to deaths. Um, in fact, they were indistinguishable in terms of the results. Uh, now, uh, what I use is the distributions from the DSTL data, which uh, I obtained via, uh, via Graham, who signed the, non -con the, the confidentiality agreement. Um, and if they are quite interesting in their own right. So if you look at the three charts, they are for distribution of days to death for 90 plus, 65 to 69, and 40 to 44. Yeah, this is for England, yeah? And um, the, the red uh, dots are the DSTL data, and they fit uh, a gamma distribution Right, different gamma distributions for the three uh, age groups. They fit them extremely well for uh, three to 28 days, but not at all for days one and two. And there's an, an obvious interpretation of that, that uh, people who are dying on days one and two are coming in uh, with COVID, tested and found to have COVID, but not because of COVID. And it's clear that this is an extremely significant, if, if that is the correct interpretation of this, uh, this, these uh, histograms straight from the DSTL distribution, it's clear that is a really significant factor uh, for young people. And probably even more so now, I don't have, this is the, the distribution over the whole period uh, of the, um, over the last uh, 15 months, let's say, uh, of, the, um, of the epidemic and not for most recent ones where because of Omicron, for sure, the, the, the with uh, COVID and, and not because of COVID will be probably even more important. So the uh, case fatality rates in, in the title are the scale factors in uh, the WSS uh, model. Yeah? And you can estimate them by least squares minimizing. You have the actual cases uh, minus the cases um, that you expect uh, from uh, 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 case, sorry, the actual deaths, excuse me, uh, minus the cases expected deaths and, and minimizing the square of that. Um, we, the, as a base case, uh, we used October, November 2020 data, which is B1.1.177 uh, as the baseline. And uh, here are the CFRs, uh, which you obtain from that. They're, they're very strongly age dependent. All this is extremely well known. Um, and, and essentially just replicate. I should say there's nothing absolute, absolute about these CFRs. Uh, they are for this particular variant, uh, for, um, uh, for people who, who definitely die within 28 days, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So um, that was the starting point. Now, how about variants? Well, uh, people have mentioned COG-UK, and I think the Sanger website has the COG-UK COG -UK, uh, data on it. And I must say, I found that absolutely invaluable. It's fantastic. So um, the, um, the data that I use for variants uh, takes the, uh, the uh, you can, I hope you can see my pointer, uh, the, the chart on the color chart on the right hand side, you can see the proportion of this, uh, the, the pink is B1177, uh, this is alpha, the uh, green is uh, delta, the AY variants down here, and then the three Omicron variants. So we use the growth of these, the percentage of the growth of these, uh, and build that into the model along with the uh, relative um, uh, lethality, let's say, uh, of these uh, variants. And in practice, rather than using the individual data points, uh, we uh, fit uh, logistic functions uh, to the growth in the variant, and, and they are extremely good uh, fits and certainly uh, more accurate than anything that, that I need for, for the validity of the model. Yeah. So that's how variants are brought in, again, public data. Uh, vaccination data, um, it's all, again, publicly available. Um, and people will know these charts um, very, very well. First uh, vaccination, second and third dose uptake. Um, it may be worth pointing out, this is the little kink, this I'm pointing out now with the pointer, the, the second dose um, uptake. Um, and you can see that it, um, it went up at the, this is uh, at the middle of uh, first, second week of January 21, and then leveled off. 
And you can see this was the time when the government took the strategic decision uh, that uh, there should not be a three week uh, delay between uh, first and second vaccinations, but a three month delay between second and, and between first and second vaccinations. And this enabled many, many more uh, people in all in, in, in the old but less old than the 85 uh, plus uh, age groups um, to be uh, to receive a first vaccination. So this is this is built in. I allow it. It's very uh, simplistic. What I do is I allow for a three weeks lag to full effect. So I simply shift these by three weeks to get a full effect. Could smear it in, I guess. I do not allow for waning. Um, and, and obviously one should do that. But as we've picked up before, I mean, the more parameters, the more surely you will get the right, uh, you will fit the, the model, but I'm keeping it simple, obviously. So I recall what we're, uh, what we're trying to do. Um, we want to take the new cases by specimen date and the deaths in 28 days and map it onto the deaths in, in 28 days. Um, so the parameters uh, I, I show again, which I'm using, and there's a key point to make here, and, and I'm sure others will have uh, found this in their modeling as well. The parameters are highly correlated. Yeah? And the simplest way to think about this is if you take the case, if you happen to be in pure exponential growth, then a shift by one day is completely equivalent to a scale factor. Yeah? So shift and scale are, are, are completely equivalent uh, parameters um, in, if you're in pure exponential growth. And more generally, um, the estimate of, of variant lethality strongly correlates with vaccine efficacy. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that makes, makes a lot of sense. So if I go on to what I um, uh, actually uh, obtained, um, it's very uh, easy to get a chart uh, like the one I've shown there. So this simply takes the, the cases expected deaths from um, you know, fitting parameters to the, to the, um, to the model. Um, and in the model, um, the cases expected deaths and divided by, or the actual over cases expected deaths. And you see that um, within statistical noise, it's not bad. Uh, the big statistical noise around April to um, Ju June, July um, in, um, in, in 2021 was because the case numbers were small then, so it's big statistical errors. And that, that seems to me, given the uh, different nature of the, um, uh, of, the, of the two uh, charts for, for cases and, and deaths to be um, you know, reasonably encouraging. You can see if you, if you look at the, um, the endpoints where, where from say December um, uh, 21 uh, through to the present time, uh, that is not particularly well modeled. And that is probably, I suspect, because I have not um, tried uh, to separate off the three Omicron variants. They're all uh, one in this model. It might be possible uh, but uh, I don't know, yeah, with the parameter, putting in extra uh, parameters. So uh, just a little bit more uh, comment uh, on, on the, the actual uh, parameters uh, themselves. Um, ONS did work with Oxford in the summer of 2020 uh, when um, the, the prevalence was extremely low. And they um, deduced then that just because of this, the small number of um, cases, uh, that the, the false positives uh, were at 0.005%. So only five tests in 100,000 yield, fal yield false positives. And that seemed to me, that's an incredible, this is PCR tests, obviously. And um, that's an incredibly um, small uh, number. We did analysis in, in September 2020 when there was a, a relatively um, small number of, um, of uh, actual cases compared with the, the tests that were being done, which suggested a number for false positives that was more like 0.4%. Um, the above data, we actually just sets false positives equal to zero. Yeah. Uh, th there is the issue, of course, that the, the number of, I mean, naively as an outsider, I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the per percentage of false positives uh, could vary according to the prevalence of, of the virus, which would, could result in higher or lower con contamination. But I'm sure there are people on this talk that will, that will um, be raising eyebrows at such a naive statement on my part. Um, the uh, other, so I've talked about false positives. The B variant is the one that preceded B.1.177. It's uh, inadequately, uh, not fully charted in, um, in the Sanger uh, data that I was using, but I could not in the data see anything different uh, for it uh, from the uh, original uh, 1, 177. 
AY 4.2 is, is um, a Delta variant, and, and I couldn't uh, significantly distinguish that from Delta in the work uh, that I did. And as I said, I haven't made any attempt to disentangle Omicron variants. So um, the key point here is that there are lots of parameter values playing off uh, vaccine efficacy against um, uh, variant uh, severity. Lots of parameter values which can give you charts uh, like the one which I've, I've, I've shown here. Um, so you might say, well, that's, that's the end of it at this point, but actually not quite. So I've got one more chart on, on this uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, because um, I'm, I'm deeply interested for, for obvious reasons <laughs> in uh, how age dependent uh, variants are, and in particular, how, how age dependent the severity of Omicron is since I tested um, positive yesterday morning. Right. And if I look at the original uh, data uh, in, our, in our base case, which was October, um, November uh, of, um, of 2020, then the, the chance of death if you tested um, uh, positive in, in my age group was one in seven or one in eight. Didn't make me feel very comfortable. So how could I explore this? If what I did actually was say, okay, let us fix um, efficacy of vaccines at a given percentage and then look at the, um, the mortality factor by age compared with uh, pre, the, the uh, pre-alpha case fatality rates that I had. Uh, and I think the results are, are quite interesting. I should say, I, uh, excuse me, I obtained this uh, with uh, using the Excel Linest function, which was very good and, and, um, and, and gave me the, the information that I wanted, um, not just the um, errors in, in parameter uh, estimates, uh, but also R squared values. And I have uh, cut off this chart for R squared um, from, it's only R squared for, for age group 70 to 90 plus, that's partly because of personal interest, but also because R squared for the fits, and the data becomes less and, and, and less reliable for age groups under 70. I mean, 80% of the, of, of the deaths occur in age groups uh, 70 plus, roughly speaking. So the, the, the data by age group is less and less reliable and less and the, the errors are less and less well fit or estimated. Um, uh, from the um, by the standard deviations that you see here, yeah. So the broad um, features that you get uh, here are if you take the um, the, the well, brown orange line in uh, for alpha, then uh, its severity, the what I call the mortality factor, relative to to the pre-alpha CFRs be uh, 0.1, 0.177. Uh, the mortality factor basically appears to be age independent. Delta, however, is even more severe for age groups than it is uh, for, uh, for older age groups than for younger age groups. And we shouldn't be surprised. There is no reason what, whatsoever why CFR should have the same age profile for all the variants. And that's what this is uh, showing effectively. And Omicron um, is uh, A, um, yes, a little bit more severe for older age groups, uh, but um, significantly less, uh, more, it's more severe relative to younger age groups, but less severe uh, than B.1.177, given, of course, that you are uh, vaccinated, right? Because all of this presumes a vaccination. Um, so, uh, in fact, just to, just to uh, uh, highlight my personal interest, if you look at the age group 75 to 79, you'll see that it has, what, is that roughly 5%? So it's about a 20th of the severity compared um, in our circumstances now uh, compared with um, uh, compared with uh, 1.177 and you've combined that with uh, 107 1 in 8 you see that the chance of my dying now appears to be less than one in a hundred which is why i'm reasonably happy um, giving this talk and i don't feel too bad it's very very mild infection right uh, so it's a uh, one thing that i should say of course is that uh, these are mortality factors after a positive test. They do not take into account the effect of reduction in the likelihood of catching COVID-19 after you get vaccinations. That's uh, well known. So that's what I wanted to say about case fatality rates. It is uh, a bit frustrating that one cannot deduce more about the parameters. And maybe, maybe one could with more sophisticated analysis, but this is what I've got. And I think I'd be interested to hear from others if the uh, age dependence of the severity of, um, of, of uh, variants has actually been explored. I should say for 
although I chose uh, particular efficacies here, the qualitative nature of these charts does not change. Yeah, it, it's uh, independent of whether, uh, I, whether I choose these particular values or, or others. So the qualitative nature that you see in the, in the chart, um, th that is uh, largely in, um, independent of exact uh, values of the efficacy of, of vaccines that I, that I choose. So let me go on to uh, uh, commenting on R value and uh, growth rate. Um, everybody, uh, for, apologies for this, you will all know this so well. Um, they're published on Fridays and the best estimates from wide range of simulations and groups submitted through SPIA. And they have received widespread publicity as government as indicated in the progress of COVID-19. Now the official figures, as I understand it, are for infections. Yeah? And of course, we're not studying infections here. We're looking at the estimate, what we can get uh, from publicly available data for new cases. Yeah. So um, it's simplest just to consider first the growth rate. Yeah, and that you could define as the uh, fractional change for us, right, for what we do in cases, and call that C of T per day on, on day T. So that fractional change is that equation which I, which I showed there, trivial. Um, if whether you call this a growth, growth rate for day T or T plus one doesn't really matter. Uh, a key point here is that um, if under reporting of infections by cases, which we know is significant, if that is consistent, it is cancelled out in the ratio. So there's some hope that in growth rate, you might get um, data which reflect reasonably well what comes out in the, from through spy and process. Yeah. So uh, here's the main challenge, of course, that we face is that if you try to take the simple day-to-day -day average, then you, you're completely screwed by the statistical noise uh, from day-to-day -day, and even more obviously the weekly variations. I mean, I, this is the chart again, and the, the peaks and, and traps are just the weekly variation in new cases by specimen date. Yeah. And we were, uh, we were we were fighting a war against the virus, but we did it roughly five days a week. I hope that's not too provocative a statement. So how, what's the simple approach? I'm sure many others have thought of this. I simply took the seven day difference. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the equation there. Um, and I have to, since it's the difference over seven days to get the difference of the growth rate per day, I have to divide by seven. This is really neat, frankly, uh, because um, it, it, uh, this, the weekly uh, weekend effect is, is automatically eliminated and the statistical variation is, is reduced by a factor of one over seven. Yeah. So I should say that in his, Graham uh, does all this stuff in a really kosher way using the R programming language and uses a different method for eliminating a weekend uh, effect, but um, it, it's the same sort of idea. And uh, it, there's an ambiguity of whether this is an estimate for the growth rate for day T plus C or D plus four, doesn't matter. So here's the, the data um, which, um, which results from that in the chart. So uh, the blue dots are the raw seven day difference. Right, and you can see the huge effect of taking the seven-day difference and the, uh, killing killing the weekend effect. Yeah, uh, the the blue line is the seven-day average with um, error bars. Uh, they're actually at a ninety percent confidence level for the seven-day average. Just statistical error, no more, of course. The green data are the weekly uh, official estimates, and it was is Graham who first spotted from from our um, work anyway that actually to get agreement you have to shift um, the official estimates back by sixteen days. And that's what I've done in, in this uh, chart. Um, I believe it was always understood that the official estimates were, because they came, they were handed in on the Monday or whatever and took time to assimilate them, put them all together, et cetera. They were always going to be a bit out of date, but quite that far out of date, I don't know. Well, it was, was on, maybe it was. Um, so it's interesting. I, mean, I think, I don't know how people would interpret that, but from my interpretation, given the simplicity of what I do, that the qualitative agreement uh, is actually pretty encouraging. Um, but it's, uh, the official estimates are much smoother than you see than, than the high uh, variations, which I see with the, with the blue curve. Yeah. So um, Scotland uh, did uh, exactly the same, and you can see that it's the um, same uh, phenomenon there, and, and it's really, really, in fact, it's, it's a similar uh, qualitative fit, maybe better. And it's interesting, <laughs> take a little bit of, um, because Graham and I both interacted with people in, in, in Scottish uh, government the, um, and, and, and PHS Scotland. Uh, the the 16-day lag is, is now stated in the weekly announcement, I think, and it was stated after we pointed this out. 
small uh, pat on the back perhaps for Graham. Um, I have a question. I hope it's not too uh, seen as too aggressive. Um, we, we know that case numbers vary really rather rapidly. Yeah? Um, growth rates are derivative of these case, derivatives of these case numbers or infection numbers. Yeah? And so it's always a bit unclear to me why the derivative is such a smooth function of something which apparently varies quite rapidly. Yeah? So the blue line I'm, I'm saying is rapidly varying. I simply don't know what, how, uh, how to compare the two because I would have to subject, I think, um, our, our, our blue data to the same kind of averaging process in order to make a fair comparison uh, with the official estimates. So um, on to uh, our value. Uh, so just very quickly uh, on this, uh, you'll, you'll know it all very well. It's, it's how many uh, people on average an infected individual can expect to uh, infect. Yeah. For us, it's not infected. It's the number of cases. Um, what's the average number of cases arising on average from one case? So, as you know, if, if R is constant, you have uh, exponential growth or, or um, one way or another. Um, and with a generation time tau. So tau is estimated to be, um, this is in the official estimates, about uh, four to five days, I believe. So what uh, I have simply done to uh, get an estimate for, for R from cases is take the ratio of cases, seven days apart, right? and take it to the power tau over seven. So I get the effect of four days multiplication uh, rather than uh, seven uh, tau uh, days multiplication. I take tau equals four in, in the data I'll show you. And again, uh, a statistical effect is canceled and, and sorry, weekend effect canceled and statistical noise reduced. So he, these are the, um, these are the uh, R, num, R value estimates for um, England and, and Scotland uh, data. Yeah. And again, I think fairly encouraging given the simplicity of the calculation. Yeah. I hope you, I would be interested in people's sense of whether that's a fair agreement and fair is the right uh, word to use there. Um, I, this, Graham picked up this comment and I see, I understand he's actually got it in his own um, presentation too, um, that um, Chris Whitty, long before he became uh, into his present uh, position, uh, in a paper entitled, What Makes an Ac Academic Paper Useful for Health Policy? Uh, has the quote there, I won't read it out, but basically it says an 80% right paper before a policy decision made is worth 10, 95% right paper afterwards, blah, blah, yeah. So I do, this is again, I think it's a, it's a real, excuse me, I didn't want that yet. Uh, it's, it's uh, did I go back? Not yet, right. Um, it, it is a real question. Uh, that, I mean, a huge effort went into, uh, as, as many people in the audience will know, went into uh, estimation produced for R value and growth rate. And um, I, it would be interesting to know how useful were these for policymakers, given that they were probably more than two weeks out of date. I say this because I recall Jason Leach, who's one of the uh, um, as people in Scotland, having to defend very aggressive questioning about high R value in Scotland when actually the R compared with England, but actually the R value in Scotland at that time was much lower. And we knew that from our estimates, but he was having to base his answers on the official uh, R value um, published um, the, just the, the, the Friday or Thursday or Friday before. So uh, final topic, and I confess I haven't got time here. I hope I'm okay. Yeah, you've got probably a couple more minutes, David, just in case okay. so to allow for any more Q and A for you. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, forgive me. Thank you. Sorry, I am. Um, thanks. I'll do that. Um, just one more topic, therefore, and this is a, a bit of fun, but it's it's maybe a, an interesting uh, uh, case study. Uh, go back to the cases data. I'm going to look in detail at the uh, peak, um, which uh, which occurred with uh, in in June, July, and. Uh, and ask the question, how, to what extent can we see that this is correlated with Euro 2020? I think everybody accepts that. Now, when we first did this analysis, it was far from clear. Yeah. So uh, if I take the England cases and just look at the age dependence of England cases. This is from the 15th of June 21 to the uh, 27th of July um, 21. And what you can see is that there is quite a surge uh, and, and, and decrease in the age groups 15 to 19 to 55 to 59. And it's broader and, and increasingly delayed for the older age groups. 
Now, if, if, if I said the England first England game was, uh, uh, was two days before this chart starts, right? So infections would, if there was an effect uh, from uh, people socially mixing, you know, not just um, um, being at game, not just being at games, but socially mixing, yeah? Um, the, the final was played on the 11th of July. And you see that the very clear peak a few days after that and very rapid decline. So it's very easy or tempting uh, to um, think that this is due to, um, that this is due to, the, these peaks are, are indeed due to uh, the effect of the Euros. Um, Scotland uh, shows it um, even more uh, clearly. I've, what you can see, if you look at the chart on the right, one of the infuriating things for Scotland, and, and this is a vent, is that the age groups used in Scotland are not commensurate. They're not the same as the age groups used in, in, um, in England. And they don't make any sense to me, but I haven't been able to, to I suggested changing them to the five-year intervals, but uh, it didn't happen. Um, even more frustrating, they're, they're different. They differ from the uh, vaccination age binning, uh, which in Scotland. So it's hard to, it's mainly why I've concentrated in England. Right, so this is Scotland data. And it's data broken down, sorry, you know, by, by age and, and sex, forgive me. Um, so look at the, the blue line is the, uh, purple is it, 20 to 24, uh, males in the, age, in the age group, 20 to 24. Um, and they uh, model uh, pretty well the, the uh, activities that Scotland uh, was involved in. Um, and the females are the uh, same color, but the dashed line. And what you can see is that um, the females increase, the females of, of, of the same age group increase and, and then uh, meet up again in terms of the um, uh, cases per thousand population um, uh, after, uh, after, shortly after the, the last game. Yeah, so uh, that suggests to me, uh, you know, even more strongly that the males were um, were at functions, social functions, uh, and not just not just at games, and they they passed it on to their female um, uh, uh, contemporaries. Yeah, and you can see the same pattern if you look at other age groups as well. I won't go into that. Um, there was, by the way, very clear. Scotland did a, a relaxation. Uh, which was very, very unusual, a strong relaxation of restrictions in pubs, et cetera, uh, during Euro 2020. It was rather special, actually, for Scotland to be in it. Um, so, uh, so there was strong relaxation, and hence hardly surprising a strong effect. Now, it, it's interesting to me, and this might be of wider interest. It, Graham was suggested, why didn't I just look at the ratio of male to female cases by specimen date? Yeah? And that's in the second chart. And you can see it's, it's extremely sharp signal. And I think this strikes me as being um, a, a very a potentially uh, interesting uh, little case study uh, for distribution, uh, for, for uh, diffusion and, and uh, infection within, uh, within uh, subpopulations. Um, in this case, a male uh, of various age groups and female uh, who have um, different, who are behaving differently. Yeah, with different, obviously different social parameters. So, and, and I think that clear signal, that sort of top hat like signal is, is maybe worth um, trying to understand just in terms of conventional or, or rather sophisticated, whatever, uh, epidemic, true epidemic modeling, not just data analysis like this. And um, there is a tiny thing which I, uh, which I must point out as well, uh, that if you look uh, shortly after that, it's about the 15th of July in, in, the, um, in, in the second, uh, in, in the second chart that's around here, there is a small evidence of a small bump, which I regarded as clearly completely um, uh, irrelevant until I realized that it was also shortly after the final um, of, on, on the 11th of July. So this is evidence to me that um, the, the Scotland, Scotland peaked after the England game, right? That was as simple as that after the game with England. I think some Scots were still interested in how England did in the final. So there we go. Um, do I have anything? Well, I think that's probably enough to say. I think the, it, there's quite an interesting model to look at the dynamics of rapid spread within a highly connected subgroup and slower spread across groups here in, in proper models, real models. Okay, so here's my uh, conclusions. I think that um, Microsoft Excel, as far as I'm concerned, has been a useful tool for this kind of uh, modeling. And given that I'm just um, a, a curious uh, volunteer for, for this uh, process, it's been quite fun uh, to do it. 
uh, it's very easy to get into. And I should not have used the word complex models here. These are incredibly simple models compared with any which you have heard about to date. Yeah. Um, uh, the transparency of data, well, you see that it's there in, in big, uh, big tables in front of you. That's sometimes helpful. The charts are always a useful check. And Excel has a lot, huge number of built-in functions. Yeah. And it, I had to, it was actually the, the Microsoft people who told me about Linus. I, I couldn't dig it out from the, the plethora that they have. And that worked extremely well for me doing, doing um, uh, linear regression. Um, downsides, I did a lot of stuff by hand. Um, data input and update and, and cut and paste, which is always uh, requires a, a good deal of uh, concentration, maybe a good thing for uh, at my age, but, um, but it limited. I'm at, at one point, I, I was doing also by um, regions in England, but it just got too tedious to continue that. Yeah, so our program probably, I should have followed David Spiegelhalter's advice. And if I'd known some visual basic, it might have been easier. Anyway, that's what I, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my acknowledgements, uh, David Spiegelhalter for getting me into it and for um, useful conversations all along. Uh, Graham Ackland for putting me and taking me under his wing and James Ackland for the collaborations. Roland for um, useful uh, com uh, conversations again and um, the, the MS research people for encouragement. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer questions on that. Thank you very much, David. That was really, really right, interesting. I'll stop my share. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I don't see that there are any questions um, in the chat at the moment, um, but I suggest um, in the interest of time, if anybody's got any, if there are any immediate questions, if people could perhaps raise their hand. Otherwise, um, I suggest if you if you wouldn't mind, if you could post them in the chat and David, if you'd be able to answer them in the chat. Yeah, that be I'll do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry on full screen i don't i can't see the timing i'm really uh, really sorry about that no don't worry no that's fine we've 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 got uh, there's lots to get through so um yeah if anyone's got any questions for david if you could post in the chat and if uh, and um i know that graham's talk will cover some of the issues so there might be questions that come up for both of you as well so graham yeah. if you're happy to uh, to take <clears> over now that would be great thank you very much david we really appreciate that thank you yeah. Let me try and share my screen.